Good evening. Um, hello. Uh, I am calling in from the not too distant past, from a different time altogether. Uh, I greet you all gathered and those who are listening to me right now. My name is Bayo Akomalafe, and I'm situated in in the beautiful city of Chennai in the south of India. And um, I want to I want to begin by by thanking the organizers for insisting that I show up this way. So there is some kind of cyborgian element to my presence. Um, what with the huge distracting earphones in my head and the fact that I'm coming to you through pixels. Uh, uh, and uh, I would also give my apologies for not being present in, more, in a more bodily, familiar fashion. Um, other travel plans and other things in my schedule um, requires me to be elsewhere um, during the time of the conference um, about the very important topic of global citizenship education, what it does and what its promises are, especially to those of us who are in the so-called global south and who have deep, viscerally, corporally felt questions about um, colonization and the tendencies of new and spanking, uh, the spanking new things to, um, to reperpetuate the same dynamics that interrupted our multiple futures and our ways of being in the world. So what I want to talk about would be emergent in that spirit, in the spirit of indigenous realities, uh, with the hope that we can think together and work together and that we are bound together, that we all have a common destiny in some sorts, in some way. But there are some I think commonly agreed um, notions that are evoked by the concept and the invitation inherent in uh, the phrase global citizenship education or global citizenry. And I just want to talk about it first. Um, but I'll start with a story. Where I come from, stories are alive. Stories are how we live in the world. Uh, the story is not folklore, um, but it comes from one of my favorite sci-fi writers, Ursula Le Guin, who, of blessed memory, who died recently. Um, Ursula wrote a short story called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, and I would encourage you to pick up the story if you have the chance to do so. Um, the story begins with a very beautiful, keen description of a city called Omelas that is rich and abundant with wealth and culture and learning and scientific achievements and architectural wonders. It's a, it's a city that is rich in, in a loaded kind of happiness. It's not the flimsy, psychedelic, whimsical, arbitrary kind of happiness, but the happiness that is grounded in real solid, tangible achievements. Um, the people are happy, the government is working, um, people are doing quite fine, um, there's personological and communal growth. Uh, just imagine, if you will, because she doesn't quite supply the details of what this happiness looks like, um, but she actually invites the readers to fill in the details. So if you will, um, think about the most, the happiest place you could ever be in, what, what that place would look like. Think about what you, you're, walk, you're working towards now as an activist, as a policymaker, as an education practitioner. Um, uh, think of what you would dream of as a beautiful place, Omelas, your Omelas, and then insert that into the story. Now, in the course of things, in the course of the writing, we learn that though this city is beautiful and happy, there is a phenomenon 
beneath the city, if you will. It's a, it's a, it's a girl, a little girl that is locked in, in a wardrobe, somewhere dank and dark and wet, and forgotten, and abandoned. Um, the way Ursula describes this girl is that she's so, she's so subhuman if you will, maybe as a result of her treatment, that one cannot readily call her uh, a girl. There is no pronoun of a her or she used confidently as such. Ursula chooses, or the narrator chooses to use an it. So it is something of an animal, a human animal that has been abused and is, caught, and is locked up and somewhere forgotten in the city. Now, do the people of, the good people of Omelas, do they know about this girl? Yes, they do. Every single one does. In fact, people are invited to go and take a tour of her circumstances, to come round the living quarters and look at her. But everyone is discouraged from offering consolations. No one is supposed to say sorry. No one is to shed a tear. Everyone just walks away. And what is the reason for this kind of paradox? A happy city, a morally complex, a morally superior city that still harbors a girl that is living under the worst kind of conditions imaginable. How could such a city exist? Well, it turns out that this city is, is its happiness is premised on the suffering of this girl that if the, the, the single moment, at the single hour that this girl is brought out of her misery, her abject misery, the happiness of thousands, of tens of thousands will disappear. The achievement, the hard work, the longevity, the emotional stability of more people would suddenly disappear. She is the fulcrum on which the city's happiness spins. She is the uh, she is the foundation. She is the dark in the in in the in the tunnel of light, if you will. She's the shadow of the city, and there's nothing anyone could do about her. I mean, what could you do about it? And uh, the narrator says, without passing moral judgment of any kind that everyone who cannot tolerate that kind of uh, moral arrangement find themselves walking away from the city. Um, they don't go back to their homes. They pass the farmlands. They pass the impressive towers and buildings, and they just walk away. They don't know where they're going, but they just walk away. And uh, one might read that short story with the idea um, that Ursula, the writer, is inviting us to pick up sticks and placards and change the world for the better, you know, to, to bring out every child from their hole and save the world. But I think there's a more complex thing happening here that the writer would have us notice. And that is the fact that um, nothing comes without its world. So nothing comes without its exclusions. Um, just adjusting one's lens in a camera means that we lose peripheral vision in order to gain focus. And in some senses, um, I want us to keep that in mind as we dive into the context of global citizenry and its nuances, especially when we especially with well-intentioned people like yourselves that are working hard to see the world become a better place. Um, we're living in the Anthropocene, so they say, and there are many other names for it that I prefer, the Capitalocene, uh, the idea that the human being is so enmeshed with geology, so uh, entangled with world processes that it's, in, that it's almost impossible to delineate or delimit the human anymore. It's almost impossible to say this is where we start and this is where the environment continues or, or stops. 
it's almost impossible to rule out the effects of anthropogenic activity on the world. And so, just like I speak to you from a different time altogether, people who look back on the Anthropocene adopt the strategy of looking back on our era and naming it, and, and they call it the Anthropocene for many reasons. Um, but one of the stark invitations of thinking of the Anthropocene is that we're being invited to ask different questions. Questions that are uncomfortable. Questions that invite us to rethink our categories of thinking. And um, I, want, um, I want to play with the idea of GCE, global citizenry. Um, exploring the concept of global citizenry, and I took some notes here, if you don't mind. Um, the more apparent and quite appreciated um, features of global citizenship education. It's its emphasis on human rights and peace and education for all. It's the in in internationalization of our values. It's, it's the idea, the invitation to notice that there are other worlds out there, you know, don't, don't believe or trust in the singularity of your story. Um, it's the invitation to trust in, in diversity, in inclusivity. And, and that feels applaudable. That feels laudable at, to, in many in regards. But at the same time, there seems to be some hidden discursive content in the notion of the global citizen. First of all, we in the global south, and I do not at all speak in any representative fashion. I speak with the specificities or with an eye for the specificities that condition my own learnings and my own emergence. There's a human centrality component over here, and not just a human centrality component, an individuated notion of what it means to be human. Not just a collectivistic, but an individuated notion of what it means to be human. And what that brings about is it repeats the same injuries that colonization has wrought in, in not just the global south, but in the west, in the global north as well. And it, I think it inserts a corporate dimension to it. I have grown in my work to be, to be quite uncomfortable with any notion of one world because it seems one world harks to um, a very, very convenient corporate narrative, uh, a commodifiable narrative, one that can be turned into commodities, one that can be turned into t-shirts, and one that elides histories. Um, uh, but much more insidiously, it, it uproots us. It, it's, the very notion seems to instigate, you know, um, a new era where, you know, we can merely start all over again. Um, diversity is difficult. Um, I, I've grown quite suspicious of inclusivity as, as a concept itself because inclusivity um, tends to reinforce power frameworks because we're including people into a power system that is um, without acknowledging that there are other ways of framing power. Well, my ramblings could go on and on, but I want to uh, itemize them. And if you will, um, just bear with me for the next five minutes. So I have noted that um, there is a, a strain of nationalism that is, that is present with the, the um, concept of global citizenry. Um, there's an entanglement with the framework of the SDGs and its reform agenda. Um, and I would encourage you to read up, or if you're not already aware of it, some of the most resonant critiques of SDGs and how it perpetuates a neoliberalism that is part of the um, elisions and occlusions of cosmologies and cultures and indigenous realities and other ways of knowing and being and learning that are quite vital to, to sustainability, if you really come to think of it. Um, 
there is a cosmology or a metaphysics of cosmopolitanism. Let's all get into the pot. Let's all mix together. We're all one. And it's one of the rarest occasions when diversity can take on insidious tones. We're all one seems like the most innocent thing to say. But um, the one world dynamics of Coca-Cola and giant corporations is the same painful uh, dynamics that has that is stripping apart um, uh, multiple contexts and environments and cultures and uh, sending us scrambling for the scarcity a world that is now defined in terms of scarcity um, then there is the assumption of neutrality that we could just start again uh, uh, abdicating our our rootedness if you will um, because the the very idea of inviting into an educational space or inter internationalizing um, our values um, seems to presume that the world is still flat that there aren't bumps and grooves and resistances in a world that is agentic and alive it 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 doesn't appreciate the fact that there are some things that will not be known there's some things that will not be embraced. There's some things that will not be included in a large framework. And meta-narratives, and maybe this is the good thing about postmodern insights, meta-narratives should be always be held with some tension. So the, te the, the meta-narrative, the hidden discursive content of global citizenry um, coincides with the same, same universalizing, totalizing effects um, that is amenable to corporate expansion and extractivism. Um, so I would say that the world is not one, but I am not advocating in closing that there is that we should stick to some kind of provincialism, that we should all remain hidden or behind walls. Um, this is not the message here. Um, the message is in fact different, and maybe I'll hark back to the message from uh, Ursula Le Guin's Omela story. It is that the world is difficult. Um, the Yoruba people say that there, there are things that will not be chewed. There are some things that will not be embraced or understood. In fact, the Polynesian culture gave us the word taboo, which comes from their word tapu, which means thread carefully. Or approach this place carefully and what we're learning with the Anthropocene in a very difficult way is that um, the human is not the center of the world that um, we are limited and we are not as um, we are not free uh, in the sense of uh, being the only agencies that can define the way the world works we live and thrive and um, grow in an orbit of other beings and this humility this noticing of our humble place in a web of life in a diffractive web of life in a differential web of life as Omelas uh, invites us to consider is one of the most powerful lessons and I wonder how the practices that are defined by global citizenship education can take that into consideration in India, there is a project called Swaraj University that will not fit into this, will probably not fit into this paradigm because the notion of, hum, of the human uh, which is needed or the notion of human nature which is needed um, or to be agreed upon to set forth a framework for human rights is not the same framework that is adopted here. The educational goals of peace and, uh, and social justice and working in the 21st century are not the same goals that they have here. The goals that they have here, uh, especially in that project which I've just named, Swaraj University up north in India, are quite specific to its place. And um, if one were to walk into that place to try to embrace it, to try to understand it in its uh, dynamic emergence, one would fall critically short of appreciating its genius and its uniqueness. Um, such is the world that we live in today.
a world of bumps and grooves and resistance, a world of obstacles. So my question is, um, what is our blind spot? What does GCE really serve? Um, who does it serve? What is it good for? Um, these are generic questions that I would uh, offer with some humility to the circle that has gathered. And I would um, invite us to, to um, consider um, the world that Stacey Alimo speaks of when she says the Anthropocene is no time to get things straight. So in our planning, in our design, in our strategizing, let us leave space for the, for the unspoken. Let us leave space for the invisible. Let us leave space for humility. Because where we are now as a species is that we are in a space where we can no longer move forward um, with brazen confidence as we would have done, um, enabled by modernity or even postmodernity. We're in a different time. And that time come, called for a, a broken compass. It, it called for a lack of confidence. It called for humility and participation with the non-human world. It calls for new kinds of questions. It calls for the kind of spirit that is evoked when my people say the times are urgent, let us slow down. And with that, I would, um, I would say thank you for listening, if you have listened. Um, and let us move awkward, not forward. Thank you.